Welcome to the DaVinci Resolve podcast here. My name is Jay Yadlowski. This is the first one of 2023, guys. Super excited. Get back into it. I know it's been a few weeks since I put out one of the DaVinci Resolve podcasts here, answering your questions. And that's what we do in this podcast, right? I look through all the comments that I get on my videos on my YouTube channel here, and I answer your questions because I get tons and tons of questions, and I try to respond to everybody the best I can. But sometimes it's easier just to get on here and talk it out and, and explain it versus leaving a comment for you guys. So that's what we do in this podcast. I pulled out a bunch of questions today that came from some of my beginner videos here. Uh, I have a crash course, a DaVinci Resolve 17 crash course, which uh, I think is awesome, by the way. Uh, But got a DaVinci Resolve 17 crash course, a lot of questions in there, a lot of comments. And I pulled out a few that, you know, seem to be fairly common. Um, And then I also put out recently a DaVinci Resolve 18 quick start guide, which isn't all that quick. I mean, it's about an hour long, but I pulled out some questions from there where we can, you know, just take a look at some of those, some common questions that might come up, you know, when people are getting started in DaVinci Resolve, because there's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. It's different than, you know, the other programs that you might've worked with or, or might've used in the past. So it takes some time to get going. The learning curve is steep. I got to be honest. I remember when I got started, man, it, it was, it was a little frustrating, you know, and there wasn't nearly as many videos out on YouTube then as there are now, but big shout out to Casey Ferris because uh, his videos kind of pulled me through, you know, learning Resolve and really getting going in it. So Casey, you're awesome, dude. Love you, man. All right. So we're just going to uh, get right into it here and uh, start answering some questions. I did uh, post in the community forum too, asked some questions from you guys and I uh, got a few questions. I know it's kind of late notice, you know, I posted it late yesterday. Um, so we'll answer some of those questions too, but um, yeah, let's just Get right into the first episode here and uh, answer some of your questions. All right. So the first question that I have here is uh, from Build Your Own Small Boat. He says, Jason, can you point me to one of your videos or make one that shows how to share assets over multiple projects in DaVinci Resolve 18? I've tried with no luck. Basically, this is for intro logo and music that I want to keep the same for each time, at least for a while. So here's what I would do. If you have uh, an intro, for example, that is going to be the same for all of your videos, I would create that intro and then you can just export it out, right? And save it, you know, as, you know, an MP4 or whatever kind of file you want. Save that. So then you could just drag that whole file that's already complete, drag it into your project. Boom, you're good to go. You don't have to really do any work with it. It's going to have everything in there that you need. It's going to have your music, your sound effects, any, you know, visual effects or whatever it might be. It's all going to be in there for you and you should be good to go. So that's what I would do if, if you've got the same intro for everything. Now, if you've got assets that you want to use um, in order to you know create your title, maybe it's going to change a little bit. What I would do is I'd probably put all those things in a power bin if you can. Now, you can't put all kinds of things in power bin, but you could put most things in a power bin. So let's just jump into Resolve here, taking a look on the screen. Power bins, how do they work? What do you got to do? Well, if you come to your media pool, you go ahead and open that up. Um, I'm just, I've got a project open here, 10 things you should know in Resolve, um, just a random project open here. And I'm going to show you how I have my power bin set up. And this is all the assets that I want to move from or have available to me, I should say, project to project, right? And as long as your projects are in the same database, you're good to go. All these things that are going to be in your power bins should show up in all your projects for you. So, In order to make sure that we see our power bins, again, I'm in DaVinci Resolve 18, the latest and greatest as of January 10th here, 2023. So you want to make sure you see your power bins. You should see it in your media pool right here, power bins. And if you don't see it, come up to the three little dots right here. And you want to make sure show power bins is selected and turned on. Make sure that check mark is there. And then you should see it over here. So power bins, If I go ahead and open up my power bins here, you can see I've got several different folders in there. If I just click on the master, um, I've got several different folders as well as some random assets kind of needs to be cleaned up a little bit here. But what I want to do is really put anything that I want access to in all my projects. I'm going to put it in a power bin and then I'll have access in every project that I go to. I can jump in the power bin and grab what I want. Now, for me, the majority of what I use in my power bins is my music right here. And if I open up my music, you can see I've got several folders in here, Uh, music from audio. I've got music from Motion Array, from Epidemic Sound. And then I have those folders, but everything else I have in here is also uh, is from um, Artlist, actually. So I don't have an Artlist folder, just everything in that main folder is from Artlist. So I want all my music accessible to me all the time, right? And, And if I put it in here, that's 
going to give me the option to be able to grab any of these songs at any time in any project. So how do I create a power bin and put stuff in it? So once you see your power bins, you can create a folder by right-clicking on master right here. Go ahead and create a new bin. And then that's going to add a new bin down there. I'm just going to leave it bin three for now, but you can name it whatever you want. Then all you have to do is just go into your Windows Explorer, your Finder, whatever it might be, and just drag and drop files into the bin here. It's as easy as that. Just drag them over, drop them in. So for example, if I want this question I got here, I'm going to drag it over, screenshot, boom, drop it in. There's my screenshot. It's in my power bin. Now I could get it in every single project if that's what I want to do. And you can do it with music, sound effects, overlays. One of the things that, uh, that I like to do is uh, here I have an overlays folder. And if I just change my view here, I've got a ton of stuff in here, things that I like to use in my videos all the time, you know, cool little graphics and things, um, all kinds of different things in here. And I'm constantly adding to my library here. So one thing to know is that if you um, are working with your power bins, what I like to do is keep everything organized on an external hard drive. For example, if we uh, take another look at the screen here, let me bring over um, my files. What I like to do is I have a Samsung T5 and in there, in my DaVinci Resolve projects folder, I have a media for all projects. And in there, I kind of break things down and I organize it, right? I've got my audio, music, sound effects, um, have different brand assets or, or different, uh, you know, overlays and motion array assets, right? I've got tons of motion array assets. So I've got it organized on my external hard drive. So when I want to bring it into a power bin, I can just come into a specific folder if I wanted to. I can grab all the items in that folder and just bring it over and drop it in. Or I could just grab the top level folder right here, bring it to my power bin, drop it in. And then it's going to allow me to um, just put everything in there the way it's inside that main folder, right? So in my overlays folder here, uh, it'll take everything and just drop it in. If I have other folders in there, for example, Blue Waves, you can see I've got other folders inside my main overlays folder. All those will automatically be created as bins in your power bins. So um, so it, it's really handy just to take your top level structure. You can drop it in your power bins and boom, you're good to go. But it's important to keep organized on your external hard drive. You want to keep organized there. Um, the other thing to know is that it will not automatically update. So if I use a folder from my hard drive, like this overlays folder right here, and I drag it into you know, my master power bins, it's not going to automatically update if I drop new things into you know my overlays folder. You constantly have to update it. So hopefully that's something that Blackmagic Design will add is um, you know live updating a folder. Say when you open up Resolve, it's going to update you know the the everything that's in the path of where you know your power bin folder might be. So, um, so good to know about that, uh, about power bins and that's kind of how they work and, uh, how I use them. I keep them all organized on the external hard drive and I just drag them in and create power bins. Um, so I can access all those cool assets in every project. So that's kind of how that works. All right. Moving on to the next question from Javier. Hey, Jason, I'm about to start using DaVinci Resolve 18. Yes, I am excited. There's a part of the program I find com complicated and confusing. This is where you work with rectangles and connect one to another and so on. At the end, it looks sophisticated, like a sophisticated future map. <laughs> what is this and how can I learn it? Thank you. Keep going. You are a good teacher. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So what I think you're referring to there is um, the nodes in the color tab. And I felt the same way when I jumped into Resolve. I was like, what, what are these nodes, man? I don't, I don't know what a node is. It don't make any sense. So I come from a photography background and maybe you do too. But basically, a node is nothing more than a layer, right? So let's just clean this up a little here so we can see what we're looking at. So our nodes right here um, just basically are like a layer and we can apply changes to each one of the layers, right? So for example, in this first node here, um, you can see because there's a little red dot down here, I've made some changes, you know, in the color panel down here. So the changes that I put on, the, uh, on this layer, I can turn off if I want to turn them off. And you could see there's on my face, let me get to a part where it's... Uh, Maybe a little bit bigger of me zoomed up here. So if I turn off this node number one, you can see it changes the grade a little bit there. Now you can do certain selections or uh, adjust specific parts of an image using uh, these guys right here. So you can see here, it's uh, really subtle, but uh, in this node, what I did was I, I selected, you know, my skin there because it was looking a little red. So if I turn it off, you can see it's a little more red on my cheeks there or whatever. So I just wanted to tone down that red a little bit. So I was able to select that red in the image, just drop it back a little bit 
and um, and just make adjustments. So really, it's nothing more than layers or or individual places you can apply adjustments. Now, why would you want to use them? Because maybe you want certain things on you know their own little node here, so that way you don't accidentally change things you didn't want to change. It allows you to separate things out. You can use the power windows for making, you know, different shapes. Like in this one here, you know, I, I've got a, a vignette around the outside. You can see if I turn it off, darkens the edges just a little. Um, and when these are connected here using the green dots, it's going to, you know, apply whatever you have on there. Um, just apply it to the entire image. Now, if you wanted to say mask out something, then that's when you want to connect the blue dots here. And let's say, for example, I wanted, you know, this, um, this guy right here, uh, the the ellipse to, you know, actually mask out everything that's in the outside ellipse. So I can just connect up the blue dots here if I wanted to apply all the way through, kind of like that. Or if I undo that, maybe I just want this to apply to the end. I can send it on over there. Now I'd want to flip it, you know, so it's going the other way. But you get the idea. Um, the blue, the blue squares and triangles are for masking. The green are going to apply, you know, directly to that image and not, not, use any masking unless you did something like I did in node number two here where I selected something um, or, well, you know, that's actually not right the way I'm saying it. I'm not saying, I'm not explaining it right for you guys because it's masking here, right? But it's not removing the image, right? Um, it's not creating like a mat or like, you know, removing the image. So I hope that makes sense. Sometimes I'm not the best at explaining some of this stuff. I don't do a whole lot of color grading. I mean, all my stuff's fairly basic, um, but there are some great uh, color graders out there like Darren Mostyn, awesome, awesome dude. Uh, Cullen Kelly, awesome. Those guys are who I watch for, you know, color grading tips and stuff. Guys are fantastic. So that's kind of how it works here. And if you're trying to, you know, create a, a mask there and you don't see the blue dot here, you want to add an alpha output. So you just right click here, add alpha output, and that's going to add that blue dot and allow you to connect up to that. So, uh, so that's kind of how that works. Or you might've been talking about fusion a little bit and same thing. These are nodes and it's like each one of these things here in fusion does a different thing. Um, it's fairly complicated. Um, I don't use fusion a whole lot, uh, a little bit here and there, but not a whole lot for the kinds of videos that I make. Um, but something I want to learn more about and, and get into a little more, cause there's so much cool stuff you could do here, but basically each node allows you to make a change on it or does a specific thing. So that's kind of how that works out. All right, moving on to the next question. Fred Miller says, thank you. This was very helpful, informative, and entertaining. What's the best way to bring sound up or down fade, but not full fade in or out? Example, starting at a lower level and fading up to a higher level or vice versa. I struggle with this. And with other editors, I used overlapping identical soundtracks to accomplish this. One track fixed it at the lower level, then bring it in and overlapped it. Wondering if there's a more straightforward approach. Yeah, sure. So this is uh, actually fairly easy to do here in uh, Fairlight. And what I'm going to do actually is just grab some music. And uh, let's see. I don't know. This one looks pretty good. Let's just drag this. We're going to drop it in the timeline over here. And um, the way that I would do it is to really just use keyframes. You know, if you want to start at a, a lower level but not have it being too loud or whatever, um, I would just use keyframes to do that. And it's fairly easy. So taking a look at this uh, track right here, let's say I wanted to start out quiet and uh, I wanted to have it you know, get louder over time. Keyframes to do that. That's how we're going to do that. So what I would do is I would come in and if you hover over this line right here, you can hold your option or alt key and click and just add a keyframe. So that's one way you can add a keyframe and you want to add maybe say two of them. And then we can come over to, you know, the first part of our gain line there and lower it down and have it be quieter. And then let's say we want it to build a little more over time. You know, I don't know, like something like that. Um, and quick tip here, if you hold your shift key while you're clicking and dragging up or down on that gain line, it's going to move the uh, DB level slower. So that way you can be a little more accurate, right? So if we wanted to do that, here's what that sounds like. Let's drag this back a little more so it gets going a little quicker there. Pull this guy out. So that's how you could do it, keyframes. Now you can also use keyframes by just putting your playhead wherever you want. You can come on up to your inspector, go to the volume section, and then you can add keyframes right here on the right-hand side of uh, your, your level there that you see. Um, so you could just click on it, move your playhead ahead, 
click on that little diamond again, and that's going to add more keyframes for you. So that's how you can do it. You make your keyframes and then you can grab that gain line, you know, in between your keyframes or whatever, raise it, lower it. And uh, that's how you're going to be able to change the volume over time without having it fade all the way in or all the way out. By the way, if you don't have a cup of coffee, grab a cup of coffee here. Hit up Dunkin' Donuts. Dude, I don't know uh, where you guys are at, but uh, here in Jersey for uh, the month of January, Dunkin' Donuts offering a dollar coffee for the midnight roast or whatever. Dude, you can't, you can't hardly get coffee for a dollar anywhere. So I'm like, I'm going to have to go there after a you know bus stop drop off. Give me some coffee for a dollar from the Dunkin'. Now, I'm not a huge fan of the Dunkin', but you know what? The dark roast ain't so bad. And uh, for a buck, hey, why not? Ah, all right. Next question. Next question we have is, thanks again for the amazing content. It's good to have a full video with chapters to go back to when you need to relearn something or just double check how you do stuff you don't use often. <laughs> I do that too. I got to go back and watch my own videos sometimes. I do have a question. At the office, I use a laptop with Windows, but at home, I have an iMac 5K. Is there a way to work on the same project using both devices? At the moment, I just take my laptop home and continue there, but it'd be nice to be able to switch from the laptop to the iMac and work seamlessly. Thanks, man. A big like, and too bad I can only give one like. Yeah, I know. They should let you do more likes, right? So, yeah, you can absolutely work between programs. Now, if you do have the studio version, you are uh, able or allowed, I should say, to use the studio version um, in two different places on two different machines. So when you purchase studio, one license, you can use it in, in two different spots on two machines. So you should be able to work back and forth as far as that's concerned. Um, now what you can do is for your media files, what I would do is I would keep them on, uh, an external hard drive. So something like what I use is a Samsung T5 and a Samsung T7, uh, SSD drives, keep your, your media on there because they're going to be good, fast drives that you can move back and forth really quickly and easily. They're small, easy to carry. So that's what you want to do with your media. So as far as the project concerned, here's what I would do uh, in resolve here. I got my project open. Um, I would come to my project manager which is this guy right here. And then I would come to whatever project, you know, you're working on. I would right click on it and I would come and go export project. Now you can export just the project file because you've got all the media with you. So you don't really need to pack it all up together. But if you wanted to pack it all up together, you would use export project archive. And that's going to grab all of your assets and everything that you have, put it all into one folder, and you should be good to go to bring it home. But since you have it all on an external hard drive anyway, probably what I would do and do some tests with this first, right, is uh, just go to export project. And that's going to export just your project file from DaVinci Resolve, not all your media and all that stuff because you've already got that. Then I would put that exported project file onto your external hard drive, bring it home. And when you get to your machine at home, then you want to do the same thing. Open your project manager here and then go to import project and then import the project file, open it up. And you should be good to go. You may need to relink uh, some of your media, which is not a big deal in the media pool. Uh, at the top left-hand side, right up here, you'll see if you need to relink it, uh, that icon there will be red. So you just click on that and then just select the path for your external hard drive there. And that should work out just fine. Um, but if you uh, exported the project archive, which included everything all bundled together, then when you get to your machine at home, you would want to go to restore project archive and then everything should load back up and you should be good to go. So it should be pretty seamless to work back and forth between two computers. Um, I mean, you could have a database with your project file on it on that external drive. People do it. I originally started that way, but um, I keep my database on my internal hard drive on you know each specific computer and I'll just bring projects back and forth like that. And that works out pretty good. So that's how I would do that. All right, next question here. The thoughts and effort put into this is just thanks worthy. Really appreciate it. I'm sure that by the time I get to the end of the video, there'll be a ton of questions on my mind. But for now, there's something that often confuses me. Media storage. If the media files are saved in an external hard drive, what uh, that would mean that one device is connected. Oh, if... Uh, I, you know, sometimes I just have a little problem reading this stuff here. If the media files are saved on an external hard drive, would that mean that once the device is disconnected, the media files within Resolve in the timeline will show an error, meaning the timeline would only display correctly whenever the external drive is connected. Yeah, that's correct. If you disconnect your external hard drive, then Resolve is going to tell you, hey, I need to relink the files. Um, I'm, you know, missing files, right? They're going to come up as red and and you're going to, it's going to tell you that they're missing. All you got to do is go relink them. But yeah, if you're using an external hard drive, got to have it plugged in. Otherwise, Resolve isn't going to know where the files are, right? It's not going to mess up your project or anything like that. You just have to relink them and then you should be good to go. So, uh, and relinking files is pretty easy. All right, next question here. 
comes from Steve Tech. What's going on, Steve? He's a very nice tutorial and service to the DaVinci Resolve audience. Thank you. Question. Where is the link to your suggested YouTube render settings? It should be embedded into the video or the link providing the details. I'm sure I can find it if I search the site. Hope it covers 2K and 4K. So when it comes to YouTube render settings, uh, I've got two different presets that I use uh, all, pretty much all the time uh, for exporting to YouTube. You can use some of the new YouTube presets there in DaVinci Resolve. Let's take a quick look at it on the screen here. Jumping in the Deliver tab. Uh, at the top here, you've got, there we go, YouTube exports, and you've got different options right here. Now, I don't use those. I use some custom export settings. Um, and just to show you, the one that I primarily use is a 1080 to 4K because I'm always editing in a 1080 timeline. All my footage is 1080. And I could convert the timeline to 4K before I render it, but actually I just do it when I render it here. And the quality I get for YouTube is perfectly fine. It all works out well. So 1080 to 4K YouTube. If you take a look at my settings here, I just use MP4, H.264, 4K, 23.976. Um, the quality here, I restrict it to 90,000, and that works out pretty good. I do multi-pass encode, and then everything else uh, is as you see on the screen here, and that works out pretty good. I mean, I get the VP9 codec when I upload to YouTube. It works out really well. Quality is great, um, and, you know, the files aren't ginormous. Uh, some of them are big, depending on, obviously, how long the video is, but for the most part, it's uh, it works out pretty well. And then I do have a preset for uh, 1080, uh, but I don't really do the 1080 much anymore. I used to when I would have issues exporting that 4K because some uh, sometimes I'd run into hiccups, but um, and then I would use the, 10, uh, the 1080. So if you're exporting in 10A, 1080, the settings I use, again, MP4, H.264, uh, most of the time I'm in 23976 for the frame rate. And then the quality, I restrict that to 40,000. And I also do a multi-pass encode on that. So that's the settings. And I do have a video about that. Uh, you can just search uh, render ex export or search export settings, Yedlovsky, and you'll see the video pop up there. So, uh, so that's how I export my videos for YouTube. You get the good VP9 codec if you upload in 4K. If you don't upload in 4K, you only upload in 1080. You're not going to get that better codec. Uh, so keep that in mind, and uh, you will see a difference there between the 1080 and the 4K. Even if you don't watch it in 4K, it's going to look better um, when you're look, watching the 1080 version there in the VP9 codec. So keep that in mind. All right, moving along. Next question here from Judy Jenkins. Thank you for the video. Quick question. I must go to work page to have access to other pages, unlike your tabs at the bottom. So it looks like we're not accessing the, or we're not seeing the extra tabs at the bottom of the screen. I do have DaVinci Resolve 17. How can I make my tabs go to the bottom? All right, so in DaVinci Resolve here, I'm just going to jump back into the edit tab. doesn't matter what tab you're in here, but if you come up to workspace at the top, come on down to show page, and right here, you're going to see uh, all the different tabs that we have currently at the bottom of the screen right down here. That will allow you to show all those, right? So if these are not checked on, then you're not going to see them. Um, and if you're having issues getting to different pages, you can always go to switch page. You see the keyboard shortcuts there to, to jump to pages if you want to do that. Um, but show page under the workspace menu, that is how you make sure all the tabs along the bottom are shown. So that way you can um, you can uh, get to all of them easily. And a uh, quick little uh, bonus nugget here. I have not used DaVinci Resolve on the iPad yet because I don't have an iPad that's new enough to use it. My iPad's like a dinosaur. But I heard that... If you use the keyboard shortcuts to jump to the other tabs on an iPad, the other tabs are actually there. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, if you're trying DaVinci Resolve on the iPad and uh, you're, you're you're giving it a shot, try that. I don't know. Try some of these keyboard shortcuts. I'm assuming you have a keyboard maybe hooked up to your iPad or something. But uh, the switch page here the on, on my Mac here that looks like the default is, uh, what's that, Shift? Shift 2? I think it's Shift. Or is that Control? Whatever the up arrow is. Just look at whatever the keyboard shortcut here is and see if those other tabs are available. Comment below if they are. I'm curious to see if, um, you know, where I saw that, if that's actually true or not. I don't know. So anyway, moving on to the next question here. Mark, here we go. When I follow, my screen looks different. Went into Workspace, reset UI layout, but my windows are either smaller or, uh, or different. I'm on the laptop. Would it look bigger or more useful? Uh, not more useful, more... Would it look bigger or m use more screen if I had an HDMI connected to an external monitor? So I do notice Resolve does look a little different depending on the monitor size that you're using. 
I don't know if there's any way to change that. Uh, but what I try to do in most of my tutorials anyway is come up to workspace and just like you said, reset UI layout right here. So that way, hopefully you guys are seeing the same thing that I'm seeing on the screen here. Um, cause it can be frustrating when things look different. Uh, you know, when you're watching a tutorial, it doesn't match what you see. Right. So I try to reset the UI, UI layout, uh, you know, every time before I do a tutorial, I'm always great at it. Uh, but, but yeah, that's what I would do. And it does look different if you're on a small laptop versus a bigger screen. I don't know that there's any way to adjust that other than just turning things on and off, you know, maybe using the, the, the buttons at the top here to show your different panels and things. And then clicking this little TV guy here, that's going to extend, you know, your panels up or down on the left and right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how you adjust the window and you just kind of got to do the best you can there with that. All right, moving on. Next question here we have is from Nigel James. He says, hey there, as a newbie to video editing, I watched this and I'm confused already with the explanation of the database. So you create a database to tell the program where the files are. My question is why keep the files on the desktop and not put them on the Drobo? All working files in one place. So the way Resolve is set up, if you're brand new to Resolve, is that the project files live in a database, right? That's where your project files are. This is not where your media files are, things like your videos, your audio, um, any assets that you want to use in your project. Those do not live in the database. Those live wherever you want to put them, on an external hard drive, on your internal hard drive, don't matter. Wherever you want to put them, that's where they'll live. And DaVinci Resolve is just going to reference those files. Now, I know a lot of people coming from other programs are like, well, I want my project file to live with you know, all my media and live in my, my folder structure on my external hard drive. And the Resolve just doesn't work like that, right? You don't have your individual project file living where all of your media lives. It All the project files live in the database. That's just how they set up Resolve. Now, you can export the project file and have a copy of it in your directory. You can load it up. But when you go to reload that file back up, it's going to put it back in your database because you have to import it back in. So that's just how Resolve is set up. It's just something you got to get used to uh, working with and, and the system that Resolve uses here. But by Resolve having that database system, it allows you to use things like power bins, power grades that are accessible in all different projects. And you can just set them up and 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 you're good to go and share assets real quick and easy in between uh, different projects and stuff. So that's just, that's just how Resolve works there. You got all your project files live in that database and then uh, any of your media can live wherever you want. Put on your internal hard drive, external hard drive, whatever you want to do. Um, I just recommend that you keep organized and uh, when you drag and drop all that stuff into DaVinci Resolve, Resolve just links to it and just keeps, you know, keeps keeps tabs on where it is uh, on your hard drive. If you move it, you'll have to relink it. But uh, that's kind of how it works and just how Resolve is set up. Ah, a little brew there. All right. Next question we have here is from, let's see, who is our question from here? Question from Gail. It says... Hey, Jason, when you talk about setting up a database folder when you start your project, what's the difference between the database you save on your computer and the database you save on your external hard drive? Are they the same and one is backup or there are two different file types? I see that by default, Resolve sets up a folder called Cache Clip, but that seems to name folders with a whole bunch of letters and numbers, but is there's no way to tell which folders for which project. Do you delete your render cache directly from Resolve uh, rather than find your folder and delete cache from the folder? So a uh, bunch, of, bunch of questions here going on. So the database. So I would recommend that you keep your database on your internal hard drive. And that's what Blackmagic recommends. So that's what I recommend. You can keep it on an external hard drive. And I did that when I first got started. And I didn't have any problems. Everything worked out fine. But when I had reached out to Blackmagic Design just to ask a couple questions, they said, hey, you should keep it on your internal hard drive. So I said, hey, okay, you guys made it. You know what you're talking about. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep it on my internal hard drive. And that's what I've done ever since. And that's what I recommend to you and anybody who asks. Keep it on your internal hard drive. Now, with the database, you don't have to worry about it being a huge file. I have a couple years worth of YouTube videos in, in my database. And when I back it up, it's like a gig. It's not that big because it's not keeping your media files, right? It's only keeping the project file for Resolve that tells it where to find everything and tells, you know, Resolve what your edit is. So there's not a whole lot of information in there that takes up a lot of space. So that's the first thing I would keep it on your internal hard drive. Now, she mentioned, uh, I see that by default, Resolve sets up a folder as cache clip. 
Um, and then has a bunch of folders with letters and numbers in it, but there's no way to tell which project is which. So you can actually tell which one is which, but you don't need to worry about it because the cache clip folder is just where Resolve is going to keep all of your cache files, which you should clean out, right? And if you delete them and Resolve needs them, it'll just recreate them again. Um, and I do recommend that people clean out their, their cache directory. So just taking a, a quick look in uh, Resolve here. Let me move this question out of the way. Um, in Resolve, if I open up my project settings, little gear icon at the bottom, and open up my project settings here, under master settings, you scroll down and you've got working folders right here. So you've got your proxy generation location. So this is if you're making proxies or optimized media, where's it going to put it? Cache files location. This is the default here. Um, it'll be, you know, wherever it's set up to go on your machine and gallery stills location. Now I can come to my cache files location. And what I do is I set all these things to go to my external SSD, my hard drive, external hard drive, because I don't want to clog up my internal hard drive with all these things. Some of these things can get really big. And if you never clean out your cache clips, those files can get really big. I'm talking like hundreds of gigs, like over time, you know, so you could just browse and then go put it wherever you want to want to put it. I put it on my external hard drive, my Samsung T7 backups, and I got a cache clip folder right there. And you can see these are all the files that she was talking about with all these weird names. And it's really hard to tell what's what there. But then you just hit open and then you can save it. And then boom, now you're good to go. Resolve is going to save that uh, location for you. And that's where it's going to put all those files. Now, when you're in a project, you can delete the cache clips or cache uh, files from an individual project by coming up to the playback menu, delete render cache and go ahead and hit all. Now that's only gonna delete everything for this project. If you wanted to delete all of it, because it's okay to delete all of the cache files, you can go to wherever it is on your external hard drive, go ahead and delete everything and you should be good to go. I do have a video on that, how I saved 85 gigs. Um, you can just Google uh, delete render cache Yedlovsky and it should come up on YouTube, I think. Um, and there was people that, I mean, cleared out like hundreds of gigs, you know, of, of cache files and stuff. So they can add up real quick and, uh, and take up a lot of space. But once you're done with your project, you don't need all that because if Resolve needs it, it's going to go ahead and recreate it. So um, you want to delete those render cache clips too, just to kind of keep things cleaned up, you know. Uh, and then, uh, what, is there anything else she asked? So that, that pretty much covers that. Um, I do delete the render cache really just on the external hard drive, not in Resolve, because then you have to do every single project in Resolve. Um, I just go to the external hard drive, boom, wipe out that folder, everything that's in it, and you should be should be good to go there. And I do that, uh, I don't know, maybe once a month or something. I don't know, whenever it seems like I remember and, uh, and I want to kind of clean up that folder a little bit. All right, next question comes from Nora. It says, in the edit tab, how can I see images for the video? I just see blue and green tabs. All right, so jumping back into Resolve here, and let me just open a different timeline that's got some video in it. We're going to zoom in here, and right now, maybe this is what she's looking at. They're just seeing this. So if you come to your timeline view options, which is right here, timeline view options, you're going to see all these things in here. Now, you might have one of these different views selected. It may be the first one. Um, if you wanted to see images on the video, you want to click either this one right here or uh, the one all the way on the left, the film strip view or the thumbnail view. Now on mine, you notice I still don't see anything. So what I need to do is grab the video track and make it a little bit bigger. And then we're going to see those thumbnails. If I click on the, uh, right now I'm on the thumbnail view, the middle option under video view options. But if you click the film strip view, then that'll show the video or a clip of the video, the entire length of the clip. doesn't matter which way you want to look at it. You can do it either way. So using your timeline view options is how you would uh, be able to see the video clips or, or a little you know thumbnail of the video clip and see the uh, uh, waveforms on your timeline. All right, next one comes from Rolling Pictures. Next question here. Thanks. Good one for a beginner in DaVinci Resolve. Do you have any tutorials where you show how to put special effects in a video? So just for those who are just getting started, if you want to apply some effects or text or um, things like that to a video... Real quick and easy, you can do it here in Resolve using some of the preset things that they give you when you download the program. And these are available, most of them are available in the free version, um, free and studio. So if you are in your timeline here, just come on up to your effects library at the top of the screen here. And under video transitions, make sure your toolbox is open here like this. Video transitions, you've got a whole bunch of uh, transitions here that, are, that come in Resolve. You've got a few audio transitions, 
Under titles, you've got a whole bunch of titles here that come in Resolve. And as long as you're in DaVinci Resolve 18, you can hover over these things, the titles, and it's going to show you a little preview on the screen there of what it looks like. You've got generators here, do solid colors. You've got noise gradients. All these are things that come in Resolve. If you click on effects, you can do adjustment clips. You can do binoculars here, uh, you know, different little things that you are, are just drag and drop. You just drag and drop them onto your clips or uh, onto your timeline. And then you're going to see, uh, you know, these things show up there um, under open effects. You've got a lot of different open effects here that are in the free version. Is And in studio, obviously, they're all unlocked and open. Some of them are not open in uh, the free version. Um, I don't know which one's off the top of my head. But if you're using the free versions, you'll, you'll see. It'll show you a little message that, um, you know, it's I think it watermarks them or something like that. But you've got color things. You've got blurs. You've got different keyers and uh, different things for lighting, glows. I mean, there's a ton of stuff here, and all this is just drag and drop, right? Drop shadows, one of my favorite. I put that on, like, almost everything, right? Text and all that. You got motion blurs, uh, textures. All these things are default settings. Wow, check out that dent face there. Uh, default settings here in Resolve, and you can use any of them. Just drag and drop it. So that's how you can kind of get started using some effects here quickly and easily in Resolve. And you just play with it and figure out how they work. And... Um, it's a lot of fun, and it's nice that they include so many things for you to use when you're getting started here. You don't have to create everything from scratch. Next question here from Andrea. It says, hey, Jason, I hope all is well with you and yours. You are exceptionally knowledgeable with DaVinci Resolve. Well, I try. Thanks. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us beginners and get started. I'm currently using beta software. How do I add a folder on the external drive, such as YouTube? So um, I'm not exactly sure... 100% what you're asking. But if you wanted to add a folder on, for your media, for example, on an external hard drive, just go ahead, set it up on an external hard drive like you would any folder. And you just drag and drop your media into Resolve and Resolve is going to know where uh, those folders are. So you want to stay organized on your external drives with all your media and everything. Uh, I'll just show you what my typical project setup looks like real quick. Um, I have a, a, a dummy project file here that I just copy and reuse and reuse. But I've, I've got a, uh, a date with the project title. Then I will come in there, and in there I have an audio folder, so any of my audio that I do. I have a draft video folder where I put all my screen recordings and things like that. Got my final video folder, and that's obviously where my final video is going to go that I'm going to upload to YouTube. I've got a footage folder, and inside that footage folder I've got several folders for different cameras that I use. I've got my 5D Mark IV, my 60D, my C100 Mark II, my GoPro, uh, stock footage. I use a lot of stock footage from places like ArtGrid, Motion Array. Uh, they've got a ton of great stuff. And really, stock footage just helps bring your videos to the next level. So I use a lot of that. And then I've got an extra folder here because sometimes I'm using you know my iPhone or uh, I borrowed Blackmagic's uh, 6K G2 camera recently. Tried that out. So I'll just you know have a dummy folder there that I can use if, if I need it. And then I've got a graphics and images folder. So anything that's like a still graphic or still image, my thumbnails, uh, things like that, that's kind of how I set up uh, or where I put all, all that kind of stuff. I just dump it in there or any other still assets that I'm going to use um, in my videos. So that's kind of how I set up my folders. And then I'll just drag and drop things into Resolve and I'll create bins in Resolve to keep organized and things like that. So really important to be organized with your stuff and uh, just make sure you can find everything when you need it. So that's kind of how I do that. All right, next question from that geek guy says, is this free? And yeah, absolutely. The free version is free. That's why we call it the free version. You know what I'm saying? But, but no, the, the Blackmagic Design does give you the free version. It does have, I mean, a ton of great stuff in it. I used the free version for a long time. And if you're just getting started, use the free version first. Try it out. See how you like it. Um, really, the free version is fantastic. Now, if you do upgrade to Studio, it does unlock, you know, effects and certain features and things like that. Um, but many, many things are available in the free version for you to use. Now, the other big difference that you're going to notice with the studio version is that the studio version will make better use of your GPU. And overall, it's just optimized to run better. Uh, from what I've seen, I used to edit on a 2015 MacBook Pro. It did have like a, a two gig graph graphics card in it. And I was using the free version worked out fine for a little while, but it was a little sluggish, you know, it, when I'm trying to do certain things, you know, nothing crazy even, but just like a little color grading and stuff. Um, grand, the laptop's a little bit older, I know, although it was a fully loaded 2015 MacBook Pro, you know, maxed out. But, um, but I was like, you know what, I, I do, I'm doing a lot of video here, getting into this YouTube thing. 
I should probably just pay the 300 bucks or 295 and just get the studio version, right? And I did, and I noticed a good performance improvement between the free version and the studio version on my 2015 MacBook Pro. So my thing for people is like, if you're editing a lot of video, spend the 295 one time, you're updated for life, you get two licenses, everything's gonna be unlocked for you. The studio version is just gonna run smoother. It's gonna use those GPUs if you got them in your computer. Um, and it's just overall going to run better and smoother from my experience. Now, it's up to you. You you decide, you know, do your research, uh, of course. But um, the studio version is just going to run better for you, in my opinion and in my experience. But I do got to tell you, it is amazing that Blackmagic can put out such an amazing program for free. Honestly, I mean, I don't know how they do it. And to not be going to the subscription model like every other program out there. I mean, goodness, you paying dollars and dollars a month just going out, right? For, uh, for for programs and stuff. It's just so expensive. And that's why I got into Resolve, actually, because A, they had a free version that I could try out. And then B, Studio was $2.95 one-time fee for updates forever, right? I mean, I'm an Adobe guy. I, I, I use Photoshop and Lightroom and use them for years and years. Still use them. Still pay for, you know, the photography plan there. And I wanted to use Premiere Pro because that seemed like what everybody was doing. But I didn't want to pay 60 bucks a month for the extra program, not when I was just getting started on YouTube. Found Casey Ferris, and I uh, saw he was using Resolve, and I was like, wait a second, they got a free version? Dude, this thing's insane for free. What? Get out of town. So the rest is history. I've been a Resolve guy ever since and uh, started making YouTube videos about it. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the story on that. Yes, it is free, and yes, it is awesome, and uh, yes, you should totally do it. All right, moving on. We have a few more questions here. Next one from Jason Lim. Hey, What's up, Jason? Nice to meet you, bro. Hey, may I check? How can I make a fast forward or slow motion video using DaVinci Resolve 16? It's going to be the same in DaVinci Resolve 16, 17, 18. Doesn't matter. Does DaVinci Resolve come with free music like Filmora? Uh, DaVinci Resolve does not come with free music, so you need your own music. And how do you speed up a clip or do slow motion? So let's jump into a Resolve here. Uh, let's just go to another timeline that's a little bit cleaner here for you. Jump into timeline number five. I'm going to grab anything and put it in the media pool here. Uh, let's see. Boop. We'll just grab myself, drop it down in there. So in order to uh, change the speed of a clip, you've got a few ways to do it here. Um, you can, first of all, you need to film your clip at a frame rate that's going to do what you want it to do. Get it right in camera with the frame rate that you want. Now in Resolve, to change the speed of a clip, I'm going to go ahead and select my clip. And you can open your inspector right here, scroll down, uh, or well, actually go to the video section, scroll down, and you've got speed change right here. So right here, you can make adjustments. You can speed up, slow down. Uh, your clip, it's going to tell you the frames per second that it's doing. Right now, minus 18. So I'm going backwards, 18 frames per second. So the minus here means the clip is playing in reverse. Um, you can change the direction with these little keys. You can create a freeze frame with this guy right here. Um, I'm going to undo that. You can set the frames per second if you want to do it that way. Um, this is not the way that I do it most of the time. Most of the time, the way that I'm going to do it, if I just reset this here, is I'm going to come select my clip and I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut command or control R. And that's going to bring up my speed change uh, on the clip right here. So you see right here, it's at 100%. If I click the drop down, we can change speed. It's got some presets there for you um, that you can use. You can reset it to 100. You can uh, speed ramp. If you want, we can add a speed point. So if you're doing speed ramping, you can add speed points to do that. Um, so that's one way to access it. Now, when you see the little blue dots up here, um, you know, instead of coming and doing a preset speed here, you know, like change speed, picking some, we can make it whatever we want too. So if I hover my mouse over, you see, we get those two little double arrows. I can click, hold, drag. Now I can make it whatever speed I want. And you can see, it's going to tell me the percent, you know, increase or decrease. See, now I'm going in the slow motion because I'm below hundred percent. Now I'm, I'm speeding it up because I'm above 100%. So that's how you can change the speed there. And uh, when you see the yellow there, it's just another indicator that you're going in slow motion. So that's how you can speed up or slow down a clip. Now, if uh, if you didn't, you want to use the keyboard shortcut, you can right click on your clip and you can come down to change clip speed right here. And you're going to get this window here, which is similar to what we see over in the inspector. Um, you can, you know, adjust the pitch here as well. Freeze frame, reverse speed, ripple the timeline, make the changes here, just like you could in the inspector. So that's another way to do it. Now, if I just use my keyboard shortcut here again, um, if you wanted to create a speed ramp, 
right click on the clip, come on down to retime curve. Now in the retime curve here, let's just adjust this so you guys can see it a little bit better. In the retime curve, we're going to have a little graph down here. So let's say I wanted to create a, you know, a speed ramp here. So you can click on the little drop down, make sure you got retime speed turned on here and that's checked on. Um, and then just, you know, click on the line a little bit and it's going to highlight it and you should be able to make, make changes here. So you can add speed points, right? So I can use the keyframe guy right here, move ahead a little bit, add a speed point like that. Uh, I can move my playhead wherever I want. I can click on this little drop down here, add speed point. I'm going to add a speed point like that. And then I'm just going to come and drag these guys up and down. So I'm speeding up that part. Now I can make it slow motion by dragging it down. So you can change it like that. Now, if I want it to not be such a hard transition there, I can select my speed point and click on this guy at the top here, the little, uh, what, what do they call this? Um, Oh, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know what you call it, but it's just going to round out the curve for you. And then you've got handles where you can adjust, you know, the way that curve kind of comes in the way the effect starts and stops. So that's kind of how you do a speed ramp there. Um, and you've got other options of ways you can click on these clips and use them and move the speed points and things like that. Um, I got a whole video on speed ramping that, that you could check out if you're interested. Search uh, speed ramping Yudlovsky should come up for you. So, uh, so yeah, so that's how you kind of change speed here on clips in DaVinci Resolve. Works out really good. Next question here. Hey, thanks for the video. If you use the YouTube rendering mode, does it use optimized files or full res files? So if you have optimized media, and this is just a, a general uh, comment about how Resolve works. If you use optimized media or proxy files, when you go to render, DaVinci Resolve is going to use those high res files just automatically, right? So looking in Resolve here, under playback, I have use optimized media if available, select it on. And under proxy handling here, if you had proxy files, um, you could prefer proxies or whatever. So if you have them created, Resolve is going to use them while you're editing. But when you go to export, you don't have to turn these off. It's automatically going to use those high res files for you. So you should be good to go. And you shouldn't have to worry about whether you're using the highest quality file. You should be good to go. It should just use the highest quality file by default. A couple more questions here uh, before we wrap it up. Hey, man, can you use Resolve as a photo editor to make your thumbnails? Yeah, you absolutely can. A lot of people do it. Um, I have Photoshop and Lightroom, so that's what I use to make my thumbnails. You can also use things like Canva or uh, Adobe Express or a whole plethora of other things online there that, that you can use that are both free, paid for, uh, or whatever. But uh, yeah, you can use Resolve to make your thumbnails, and I know a lot of people do it. Personally, I don't do it because it's just easier for me to do it in, in Photoshop. Um, and in my opinion, Resolve is built for video and stuff, not really for photo editing. But yeah, you can totally do it in there. It's not a problem. It works. Um, but if you if you got another video or photo editing program or app or something, you pro I would do it in there because I think it would just be quicker and easier. But yeah, 100%, you can do it in Resolve. And I know people do that. All right, last couple questions here uh, from a post I put out yesterday, late yesterday. Uh, because uh kind of didn't 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 really uh know when I was going to be filming this episode here. Um so let's just run through these real quick. From Andy H Photography. Hey, he follows me on Vero. You guys on Vero? I'm on there. I do some good stuff on there. Head on over, check me out. Search for me, Jason Yulovsky over on Vero. I'd share the uh, link to my profile, but I'm not really sure how to do that. I got to check that out. Anyway, it says, hey, Jason, maybe a bit specific, but I'd like color calibration when using an iPhone. I do have a whole video on that, how to color grade an iPhone. Just search uh, iPhone color grade or you know, iPhone color grade Yudlovsky. You'll probably find it on YouTube. So check that out, and uh, and that video will explain well, everything to you. Steve Media, I'm thinking of purchasing the studio for uh, FX and GPU acceleration. How much faster might my RTX 3070 render uh, H264-265-4K footage with Studio. I have a Ryzen 5800X CPU with 32 gigs of RAM. Well, I don't have any numbers exactly how much better it's going to work for you, but uh, based on my experience, I could tell you it's, it should work quite a bit better. It should make full use of your GPU, whereas if you're using the free version, it's hardly using any uh, of your GPU there. So it should make a good difference. And if you're you know creating a lot of videos and stuff, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast here, just just upgrade. It's worth the two ninety five. dollars um, If you're doing paid jobs, just charge a little extra, you know, an extra 50 bucks here or there on two, three jobs, pay for itself. You won't regret it. Uh, the, the, the thing that I've noticed with Resolve Studio is that it just runs a whole lot smoother and better uh, for me on, uh, you know, using the studio version. I'm on a M1 Mac Mini and it works great. Um, I do still use the free version on my 2015 MacBook Pro sometimes just to try things out so I can make sure, you know, things I'm helping you guys with uh, work using the free version and stuff. But Studio, 
it's the way to go, man. Just just upgrade one time fee. You're done. Boom. You'll be uh, off and running, and you're going to see a good performance improvement. So um, do your research though, and and make sure you want to do it. Don't just do it because I'm telling you to do it. All right. Next guy, Quasar. Quasar. Woo woo woo. Quasar. I just think of a circle and flashing light. Is it possible to cut the noise floor off an audio track uh, away and then optimize? Uh, I'm sorry, and then normalize the track without any background noise? Yeah, sure. If you uh, use the uh, voice isolation, so just taking a look over in in DaVinci Resolve here. Uh, let's make this guy a little bit bigger so you can see. So if we had an audio clip selected, we've got voice isolation here. That's going to remove the background noise for you real good. Definitely use this. Don't use the uh, noise reduction effect that's in Fairlight, or you can use it in the edit tab, but that one don't work so good. Definitely stick with the voice isolation here. But you can turn on the voice isolation, then you can either export out this track or bounce it to a new track, and then that voice isolation should be applied. And then you can go ahead and uh, and make changes to um, to your 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 normalizing of the track and stuff like that, and that noise reduction should be baked in there for you. So your background noise should be gone. So that's how I would do that. How about organization of a project, perhaps based on one of your own podcasts? So as far as organizing my files on an external hard drive, we already talked about that. Um, that's how I do that. When I'm in DaVinci Resolve, what I do is I'll create bins for different things, right? I'll, uh, a lot of times I'm using my project uh, to film and record you know, my videos and tutorials. So I'll have you know a, a, a bin with that, with all my examples and things in there. Um, and then I'll have a, a separate bin that's my YouTube video. So once I go to edit together the YouTube video, I'll, uh, I'll have a, a bin for that. And I'm going to put in my screen recordings. Well, just overall, this is what I usually have that goes in my video. Screen recordings. I've got audio exported from the screen recording that I sync up with my camera because it's usually one of my good microphones. I have um, whatever I filmed on my C100 Mark II or any of the other cameras. I've got my footage. Uh, I'll have various assets from Motion Array. I'm always grabbing stuff from there just to kind of enhance the video a little bit. I'll have any music if it's not already in my power bin or something specific for a project. I'll use any music or sound effects. Although most of the time, I'm going to put all that stuff in a power bin so I can access it in any project. Um, I'll have any logos or, um, you know, uh, any still images that I might need, uh, any overlays, things like that. And if we just look at this project that I've got on the screen here, you can see, uh, let's just clean this up a little here for you. So in the media pool here, I've got, all right, I've got this guy with the head, some overlay assets. I've got things that I might want to try, like uh, like this flower here, this exploding flower. Maybe I want to try that. Uh, I've got the Epidemic Sound logo. I've got my own logo. Um, sometimes I use that. Just random assets. This dude walking that I had him walk across the screen, right? Um, I've just got all kinds of different things. And, and anything for my video, I keep in there. Sometimes I break it down further. Most of the time, I don't need to. I mean, what I do for YouTube here, it's it's fairly basic when it comes to assets and things. Um, it's not like a huge, you know, documentary or some kind of project like that. So um, that's kind of how I, I I set up Resolve and, and my projects. It's really it's pretty basic, um, but I do keep it organized so I know where things are. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I do that. Next question: How do you save titles for future use so you don't have to create them again? Uh, for me, most of the time, I just, I mean, the titles are, are pretty basic. I just, you know, kind of keep them uh, or just remake them, you know, and, and, and tweak them as I need for each, uh, you know, individual project or the times that I'm using it because uh, I do change them and stuff. But you can, uh, I believe, throw it in a power bin, right? I think we could throw them in a power bin. Uh, let's just try it here real quick. So if I have a piece of text, let's just go find a piece of text here. YouTube video. Scroll down. Uh, is that some text? Yeah, that's some text. Drag and drop. Boom. Yeah. So you can just save it in a power bin. That's what I would do. Create your text. You got it all set up the way you want. Drag and drop it in a power bin. Then it's going to be available for you in every single project. Boom. You're good to go. You got your text. Uh, next, Randall says, can you touch on how to best color correct and grade footage shot with 8-bit 4.2.0 codec? So, I mean, the color grading that I do is fairly basic. Um, Again, like I mentioned earlier, I would, if you want to know color grading stuff, go check out Darren and Colin. These guys are awesome. Um, they know way, way more than I do. I mean, I barely know anything about color grading, if I'm being honest. Um, a lot of times when I'm film, filming with my 5D Mark IV, it's not a raw format, so I'm just kind of tweaking colors a little bit to to make it work and make it look good. Um, on my C100 here, it does have a, uh, a log setting and uh, film in that. Um, what I do when I get into the color tab here, is uh, I'll add a couple of nodes and then uh, open up the effects here. 
sorry, itch my head. Um, I'll come down and throw a color, pa color space transform on there. And then you can adjust these settings here at the top so that it works for your particular clip. Um, and then you should be good to go. Then you can come in here and, and, you know, color grade. And I just kind of color grade the way I do photography photos, right? Um, you can adjust your, your exposure, your, your contrast, your colors a little bit, make sure you got some good white balance. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. But if you really want to get into color grading, definitely go check out Darren and Colin. Like I said, those guys are awesome. Um, and, uh, that's who I watch and go to when I have color grading questions or, you know, anything I need to know about color grading. Franklin says Fairlight is to the next DAW. I think what he's saying is Fairlight going to be a DAW. And if you don't know what a DAW is, a DAW stands for Digital Audio Workstation. Um, something like uh, Pro Tools or something that's like a dedicated audio program, uh, you know, mostly used when you're mixing music uh, and just audio work. And I don't know. Um, I mean, I have no insider information uh, about Fairlight. I can tell you that it seems like it's going in that direction. There's uh, a lot of great things in Fairlight. It's not quite uh, a full DAW yet. Um, but I think... If I had to guess, I would say that, you know, I think Blackmagic is going in that direction, and I don't see why not, right? They have um, done so much in Resolve here to make it awesome, and they keep adding stuff and adding more things, and and I, I just don't see why they would not make it a full-fledged DAW that I could, you know, bring it in, open Resolve, hook it up to my 32-channel Behringer X32 that I mix on, and record multi-track into it. Right. Um, cause I don't think I can do that at the moment. Um, I use a free program like Reaper or obviously any of the other, you know, audio only programs out there you could do it with, but I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's going that way. Time will tell. Um, but Fairlight just keeps getting more awesome and more awesome. Um, love me audio. If you guys watch my channel, you know, I love me some good audio. It's just, it's, it's audio is so much fun. The whole thing's so much fun. Video, audio, everything's so much fun. So, um, I don't know. We'll see. Time will tell, but, um, if I had to guess, I would say, yeah, I think it's I think it's going that way. And the last one, Mohit here, he says, how to edit content videos. Well, if you just check out any video on my channel, that's going to help you uh, in editing. Um, not sure specifically what you're trying to do, um, but I've got videos that are just going to help you in the whole process. A lot of it starts with an idea, right? What are you going to make? You just got to you just got to get started, right? A lot of us, who knows where we're going to get started with the videos that we make and stuff, but you just got to get started and, 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 and get going, right? That's kind of true for starting on YouTube, making any kind of video or any kind of creative work. A lot of people want to get perfect and want it perfect before you get started. But if you wait for that, let's be honest, you're probably never getting started, right? We could all go back to the beginning of our YouTube channels and look at these videos early on and like, we're like, oh man, it's like cringeworthy, you know? But hey, that's where we got started. Everybody's got to get started at some point and you learn as you go, right? You, you learn what works. You learn what you got to do. You learn different aspects of video editing or, or YouTube or whatever it might be. And over time, you're going to get better. You know, you aim for like 1% like better every video, right? You just get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. And over time, you're going to see, uh, you know, a big difference in your videos. And, um, you know, that's what I try to do too. Like, I feel like I'm no expert here. I'm just uh, maybe a step ahead of you guys. And I'm just trying to share, you know, how, how Resolve works and all that kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, right? And uh, and I got to learn more. And, and that's actually one of my goal, big goals for this year is to, to learn more in Resolve and just kind of, you know, further my knowledge and, and uh, just push ahead and continue to learn. So that way I can share with you guys. So that wraps up the DaVinci Resolve podcast episode number five here, guys. Thanks so much for hanging out. I hope you guys find this info helpful. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to just continuing to answer your guys' questions here on the podcast. Hopefully we'll get some guests on uh, this year. And um, I'm just going to keep doing it. You know, like I said, maybe 10, 20 episodes, something like that. See how it goes. If you guys are enjoying it, you're getting some value out of it. Uh, I'm more than happy to keep doing it. It's fun. Um, answering your questions and uh, like I said if we can get some guests on here that would be pretty cool too uh, maybe some of your other favorite Resolve uh, podcasters or whatever that would be cool so um, so with that said guys thanks so much for submitting your questions here on YouTube thank you for watching my videos for dropping comments dropping likes subscribing to the channel all that fun stuff really appreciate you guys uh, 2022 was a great year uh, for me here on YouTube and uh, really looking forward to 2023 here on YouTube as well, as well as the DaVinci Resolve podcast here, wherever you might be listening, Spotify, Apple, Google, wherever I put it. 
Uh, so hopefully you guys are, are, are getting some value out of it. But uh, looking forward to just continuing to do what we do here, helping you guys out. And uh, with that said, guys, we have the first podcast of 2023 here in the books. Looking forward to a lot more. And uh, you guys have yourself a great day. And with that said, I will see you or talk to you in the next podcast or video on YouTube. All right, guys, take it easy. We'll see you. Peace.